Good evening. I'm Robin Zoll from Stoughton, and along with my co-president, Joanne Blatt of Sharon, welcome you on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Sharon Stoughton. This forum is being recorded for future broadcast on local cable. After Mr. Baird speaks, there will be a question and answer period. Please put your question in the chat box addressed to the question monitor who will be asking the questions. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, multi-issue organization that encourages informed, active participation of citizens in government. We always encourage new members, male and female, to join us. Please check our website, lwvss.org, and like us on Facebook and Instagram. I'd like to introduce Sharon Fratkin, our secretary, who, along with her husband, Steve, have made this forum possible. Um, Sharon? Thank you, Robin. I'm Sharon Fradkin. I'm a longtime League of Women Voters member for Sharon Stoughton. And uh, we have a long time history in supporting reproductive rights in the League. Um, and my husband and I are personal friends with Bill Baird. Um, and my husband was, is going to introduce him to you. He started all of this. Steve? Thank you, Sharon. 50 years ago, a guy walks into my office, a convicted felon. He had been in jail for the heinous crime of showing and giving birth control products to single women. As his case was wor working its way up to the United States Supreme Court, he was out speaking at colleges and universities throughout the United States. I helped him with advertising and we became friends. Two years later, he won the first of three Supreme Court victories. Bill Baird is more than a guy who did a good thing. <clears throat> He's a living example of a spirit Barack Obama called, yes, we can. He is a beacon for all of us who see wrong and try to fix it. He had the unmitigated goal to fight the system and he won. Not just once, but over and over again, his entire life, arrested, tried, jailed, attacked, insulted, condemned, and ostracized, his campaigns and successes have resulted in freedom for millions of Americans. Some people are lucky enough to meet great people, to admire them as heroes. Me, I'm lucky enough to know and share a long friendship with a man I admire as my hero and personal inspiration. Now I'd like to share them with you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Bill Baird. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Bill. All right. So, Bill, tell us what happened. Well, I gotta ask Steve, uh, should I give Steve the check for such a beautiful? <laughs> yeah, if only. Is it a big one? <laughs> uh, Ten dollars. Um, Bill, <laughs> tell us. Tell us how. Steve, we're watching you drink coffee. You can mute your video if you want. Um, Bill, tell us how you happened to get involved in caring for women and reproductive rights at the very, very beginning. Like what made you even think about doing something? Well, I think what you really have to do since this question is asked so much is my background. I grew up as one of six children in great, great poverty in the Great Depression. And uh, I had a sister who died. And this was, I think, my fundamental message to everyone. She died because we didn't have money for a doctor. She had appendicitis. We were told it was a menstrual cramps, appendicitis broke, and she died. She was only 12 years old, and I was nine. I had a one-year-old baby brother who also died at the age of one because we didn't have money for a doctor. My parents were immigrants, uh, not well-educated, and uh, although each one of us, the four survivors, became fairly well-known. My brother was a very famous MD, another brother, well-known psychologist, and a sister who was well-known in, uh, I hate to say this, in politics, all of them were very powerful, well-known Republicans. I was a mutant of the family, the renegade who said, nope, I disagree with all of your views. I think people have individual rights. And uh, so th with that background, I graduated uh, Brooklyn College, I played on a soccer team. My favorite headline was the best player against Navy was Bill Baird. Uh, that was my claim to fame. And my other claim to fame in high school was I was listed as a class streamer. I was always talking about making the world a little bit kinder and better than what I had growing up. So with that in mind, after getting married, uh, 
I went into the uh, U.S. Army, and then after that, I got hired by a drug company that made birth control products. And uh, I was clinical director for that drug company called Emco, a vaginal phone company. And my job was to coordinate research. And uh, at the very beginning, I went over to Harlem Hospital, which is, since I was fascinated with poor people, I went over to Harlem, that place, and I uh, heard a scream. And I stopped talking to the research people, ran into the hallway, and I saw a young black mother covered with blood from the waist down as if somebody had thrown a can of red paint on her. And I caught her as she slumped to the floor and she had a piece of wire coat hanger sticking out of her body. And of course, it was too far gone, she died. And I was outraged that somebody could die because in New York State, you could not get birth control and you could not get an abortion. And so I went and I remember telling the doctor there's something wrong. Well, there's a law against it. Law 1142 says you cannot give uh, information on birth control or abortion. I went to Planned Parenthood. And this will shock some. That's why I have on this desk a huge document. If any one of you hopefully will challenge me, I can prove to you uh, that all the information you had was wrong. That Planned Parenthood was very much opposed to birth control for unma unmarried people. Their literature said abortion takes the life of a child. Uh, and they were very much opposed to abortion. Uh, so I decided I would try to fight the law. And I went from area to area in poor areas and I got stopped. People said, you can't come into our area. So I felt I would take an old United Parcel truck, 25 foot truck, fix it up, make it look like a living room. And I would drive into poor areas. So you look like you're coming to a friend's house and you would come in and I would talk to you about birth control and abortion. And I found out the ignorance was so appalling, so frightening that women would come to me, say they would take douching bags, fill it with Lysol or bleach or turpentine or they would take soap suds and not realize that soap is made from fats and the body could absorb the fat from the soap and they would die of a fat embolism. Or women would take a baster right around the corner we got Thanksgiving, we had. So if you take grease or oil, or for that matter, soap suds, and you put it in a baster and you squeeze that into the uterus, you can indeed induce an abortion, but often the fat in the soap suds can kill you because of a fat embolism. Or if you squeeze the top of the syringe too hard, you can force air into a major blood vessel and they can die of an air embolism. Yeah. So I, decided I would challenge these laws and way back in 1965, I was arrested in that Mobile Clinic for teaching birth control to poor people in Hempstead, Long Island. Jailed overnight, uh, had to face a year in jail term. Uh, and then I got a call from New Jersey a group of people were calling me, pleading with me to come to Freehold, New Jersey, that a man by the name of Marcus Daly, a prominent legislator, was going to jail unwed mothers. And he was going to jail them under the charge of fornication. If you fornicate in most states in those days, that was a one year jail term, not for the man, but for the woman. The man was called a ladies man, super stud, uh, Don Juan. Women were called, called whores or tramps. And I thought that was so outrageous. So I said, somebody ought to fight that law. When I told that to the fellow, Marcus Daly, he said to me very clearly, Bill, you come here and we're gonna jail you. So as you guess what I did, I drove the mobile van there. I went there, taught these poor women birth control, arrested, convicted, sentenced to prison for 20 days. The reason I give you that background, then I was also jailed in New Jersey, and not only New Jersey, but Wisconsin, other states across the country, eight times in five states. But by that time, Ray Mungle, a beautiful young man, the editor of the BU News called me, said, Bill, would you please come and fight our law called Crimes Against Chastity, Morality, Decency, and Good Order. And listen to this carefully. It has a heavy penalty of 10 years in prison if you lose your case. I said, whoa, I said, uh, I don't know any lawyers. I don't have any money for a lawyer. Well, don't you worry, uh, we'll have a lawyer for you from the ACLU. I said, well, I still am not so sure I wanna do this. Let me think about it. And then I did think about it. I said, you know what? Just suppose, Massachusetts, you have the toughest law in the country, 10 years in jail for the two violations I was considering. If you challenge that law, maybe I could get the law changed, not just on birth control, on the right of privacy. Maybe I could get a change on abortion, but also for gay rights, because I was a fighter for gay rights as well. So I called him back. I said, as long as you get me that lawyer, I'll be there. April the 6th, 1967. 
I stood before 2,500 people, the largest audience ever at BU. I'm gonna show you this magazine. I hope you can see it, Time Magazine. Now the law said, if you print, publish, exhibit, any means of birth control or abortion, it was a five year jail term for each charge. I don't know how well you can see this magazine, but it's the day I was arrested, April the 6th, 1967. You see a photograph of the pill. You see the real pill on top. And on the bottom, you see Joseph's baby aspirin that looks like the pill. What I was doing, I thought smart. I was trying to trap the police, trap them into making me get arrested on the false charges where they couldn't really prove anything about the case, but they could prove that I was breaking the law under the conditions I wanted it to, which was exhibiting birth control devices as well as pictures of them, which you could not do. Held it up, what do you think the police did? Nothing. So <laughs> the next thing I did, I was gonna tweak their nose. There's a guy you know, a famous man by the name of Cardinal Cushion. A good guy, I'm sure, he had a great reputation. He had a pamphlet called The Rhythm Method. For 10 cents, I bought it from a Catholic bookstore. I held it up. And I said, if you arrest me to the dozen policemen and about a half a dozen uh, TV cameras, if you arrest me, you must arrest the cardinal. Who calls for an arrest of the cardinal? And I said, if you arrest the cardinal for showing a uh, printing an illegal pamphlet called the Rhythm Method, did nothing. That was ticking me off because in order to have standing, you got to be arrested to bring it into the courtroom. So the next thing I did. I picked up the Bible. Now, this doesn't mean to offend you, but if you're offended, so be it. Genesis 38, 9 through 11. God told Onan to have intercourse with his dead brother's wife, which he did. Kind of like the idea of that. But he didn't want to have a baby, quote unquote. So he spilled his seed on the ground. Now, spilling your seed on the ground, another word is called what? Onanism or withdrawal or coitus interruptus. The law said, if you print, publish, you have any information of any means whatsoever, you broke the law. Therefore, every single Bible in Massachusetts broke the law. I thought that was pretty clever. And this way I could get all the churches caught up with it. They did nothing. There's a place you may have heard of called Zare's Department Store. I hear that word carefully. Department Store and Raymond's Department Store in downtown Boston. I said to a young lady ahead of time who was only 19, in those days you were a minor, if you're under 21. So I was fighting for minors. So I wanted to give the minor, with her permission, a can of foam. I'm clinical director, so who knows that product better than me who taught doctors the research for it. Gave the can of foam and a condom. The moment I gave it to her, the police said, you're arrested. I said, hold it. And they did. I took out of my pocket a sales receipt from Zaire's department store. It said, foam, $3, nine cents sales tax. I said, wait a minute to the police. If you arrest me, you must arrest the attorney general because he's collecting an illegal sales tax on an illegal sale since it's from a department store. Well, they didn't think I was very funny. So they started to arrest me and I remembered I hadn't heard a peep from Planned Parenthood, from not only Planned Parenthood, but I didn't hear a peep from the ACLU. So I said, the ACLU said they would be here. Are you here? Please raise your hand. Not once, not twice, Three times, finding a guy by the name of James Hamilton. Stir up, Baird, we will take your case. As I was being let out, they took me to the prison. And of course, James Hamilton came with me. What do you think happened three weeks later? Three weeks later, the ACLU, James Hamilton, called me up. Bill Baird, we have talked with Planned Parenthood. We both agree your case has absolutely no constitutional value. I said, wait a minute, I know the law. I clearly broke the law. And that law is unconstitutional. No, it's not. We're not going to pr uh, protect you. You have to find another lawyer. Uh, just imagine you're me. You're from New York. You know hardly anybody in Massachusetts. The lawyer that I was promised is not there. I got four little kids at home. How the heck am I going to handle this? So anyhow, to make a long story short, I called uh, several prominent lawyers. Effie Bailey, if you know him very famous guy at that time, said, Bill, I'm in a murder case, can't take a case. Out of nowhere, a criminal lawyer, a very tough guy, by the name of Joe Bolero, he says, I like a, big, a guy with big horns. He says, I rep will represent you, I represent the mafia, but I will represent you. And he took my case. And believe it or not, what do you think happened 
when I was fighting this case. Planned Parenthood issued the following statement. We've lost the audio. Excuse me. I, I couldn't hear you. Is something wrong? Are, are people hearing him? Yes. I, I hear him. Yeah. I can hear okay. little pictures on my screen though. Can, can you hear me? Now I can hear yes, you. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Okay. So they issued a news release. Uh, and this is, by the way, so you dated in 1966, before I was arrested there. Students, a little higher. St st students picket Planned Parenthood. Okay. Good. Then another one, because they wouldn't give out birth control. I had said to uh, the Planned Parenthood, to the Boston University, I said, hey, I said, why don't you go to Planned Parenthood? They got money. They got lawyers. They won't give out birth control to unmarried people. Here's one of their pamphlets. Their pamphlets. So. They've conned you for years when they tell you we always supported abortion and birth control. Statement on abortion. Abortion takes the life of a child. They were opposed to abortion. I was fighting for abortion in those days. This is this. Bill, Bill, excuse me. Can you give me an idea of the year that you're talking about? Like when in history was that? But this all went on through the 60s. Through the 60s. Okay. And, and the 70s when I was fighting this law needing support from if at least from your own allies. Here's Planned Parenthood newsletter, spring 1967. There is nothing to be gained by the Baird case. Nothing. Think of this, you're facing 10 years in jail. There's nothing to be gained by what you're doing. Here, you can see a stalk. It shows the only conditions for birth control. If you're married, this is in writing, or if you're engaged, with a statement proven you're engaged, about to get married. This is a letter from Planned Parenthood on their newsletter, their stationery, saying our lawyers, experts in constitutional law, say there's nothing to be gained by the Baird case. Can you hear that? Hmm. Why I want you to hear this. I'm sick and tired, as you see now, how many times you see on network television, Planned Parenthood on the air, telling the world to this day how they legalized birth control. There's a very famous case called Griswold versus Connecticut. Many of you know it. And you don't know what it stands for if you think that it meant for unmarried people. The Griswold case was for only married people. Did you hear that? So when I called them up, I said, why are you discriminating against unmarried people? Because we don't give out birth control to unmarried people, was their answer to me. They would not give out birth control. I said, you're wrong. Unmarried people are every bit as important, no matter how old they are. My youngest patient, by the way, I had at my clinic pregnant by her own father, was 12 years old. Clippings here will document that for you. So at any rate, it was very frustrating to be facing a 10-year jail term. Joe Bolero steps forward. He says, I'll take your case. And then find out that I'm being stabbed in the back, but not only me, but women who needed this case because nobody had a birth control case for unmarried women, regardless of age, in a hundred years. Mm. That's why I was willing to risk you, risk 10 years of my life. If you don't think I wasn't aware that the Charles Street Jail was a hellhole, that people committed suicide by jumping off the third rail, which is where I was, uh, it was a horrible place. How and long were you there? I was, I was into my third month when I uh, got the call from Joe Bolero that the, plan, that the uh, Supreme Court would hear me. So we went all the way up to the Supreme Court and this in a way cost me one of my closest friends. And this is a story rarely told, but I will tell you because it will give you an idea of what you may think is a crazy decision or a brilliant decision but I had to make a decision because I got a call from United States Senator Ernest Gruning, the former governor of Alaska. And he called me up and he said, Bill, we want you to fire Joe Bolero. I said, are you kidding me? He's my friend. He took my case. Well, he said, I have something more important to tell you. I said, what was that? He said, we've been watching what you've been doing for years very carefully. And we have United States Senator Joseph Tiding who thinks you're a very strong man and he wants to represent you. I said, I can't do that. Joe has represented me all these years. He said, don't you understand? This guy, meaning Senator Tidings, 
knows everyone on the Supreme Court. They have lunch together. They go playing golf together. No one ever heard of Joe Bolero in before the Supreme Court. I said, my friendship is very important. Then he smacked me real hard. He said, Bill, what's more important to you? Did you go to jail in other states to save the lives of women, to give them the chance to be heard by the highest court in this nation? Or do you feel more loyalty to your friend? That was not a hard question. My whole life was committed to save the lives of women. So I said, thank you for putting me in my right place. I said, I will uh, let Joe, and Joe sued me by the way. And I loved him and I feel badly, uh, but he never quite understood that in order to save the lives of women, I had to be heard by the Supreme Court. Now I have to tell you this, this is crucially important you understand this. When you appear before the Supreme Court, you've got to file what's called a brief that's on certain kind of weight paper, colored paper, colored ink, and it costs $2,000 plus. I didn't have two grand, so it was 2,500. So I called now. I said, now, would you help me? I don't have, nope, we're not helping. We won't even file an amicus brief. Listen to those words carefully. Amicus brief means you support the right of women who are not married. They refused to do that because it was brought by a man, which is to me the epitome of sexual discrimination. So I didn't know what to do. I could have fled back to New York. Uh, I'm a consultant at that time to New York State Senate. You could never extradite me. So I wouldn't have to face 10 years in jail. So I decided what to do. I had to work within the system as I promised and suddenly Playboy Foundation called me. They said, Baird, we hear you're broke. We hear you don't have the money for this. We will give you the $2,500. I said, fine, that's great. And I took it. Who do you think called me? One of the leaders of now called me up. How dare you take a penny from that chauvinistic group? I said, are you freaking nuts? This is the first time in history for women to be heard who are not married by the highest court in the nation. And I, maybe I won't win, but I have a fighting chance of fighting for the dignity and freedom of women under the right of privacy. And they hung up on me and they've had very little to do with me since then. By the way, Betty Friedan, the founder of NOW, said in uh, 1971, uh, in many public hearings, Bill Baird is a CIA agent. I'm a government spy. Uh, Gloria Steinem has nothing to do with me. Uh, a lot of the other feminists have said, we will not back a man head into the Supreme Court, even though women will benefit because we don't want a man benefiting by it. This desk is strewn with documents that say how women don't like men in their movement. That's one of the things I'm hoping I can chat with you about today. If we're ever gonna succeed, we gotta get over these freaking hangups that movement people do. Gays wanna stay with gays, blacks wanna stay with blacks, women with women, that's crazy. We're all people. We are all part of the human family. I will lay down my life for a gay person I filed the first bill, I don't know if you know this, for gay people in 1969. I don't wow. know. If, Didn't know okay. that. Bill, somebody has a clarifying question. Can Lindsay yeah. just ask it to you? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. um, thank you. So how long did it take for your case to get to the Supreme Court? And were you still in jail the whole time while you were well, waiting? I was in jail going into third months and I was released temporarily. Okay. So my case would be heard. Uh, but it was very frightening because if I lost, I'd go back into prison. But my bottom line was this, that I was marked in prison. That I mean, uh, how do I say this? I'm one of the most shy guys you'll ever meet. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't screw around. Uh, I'm very boring today too. My wife will probably tell you that more. Uh, but I'm a fighter for a cause. And they would come in the middle of the night, take your clothes off. Why? Well, you heard we have, you have drugs inside your body. And they would abuse me in ways I cannot yet get over. So I had many scars. The prison was on fire. Smell of the burning flesh of an inmate burning to death. Oh, God. Burning dreams. And I'm in that environment. So how long did it take, though? Uh, it took Who me from it? 1967 until 1972. The Supreme Court heard me. So uh, that's five years, huh? Yeah, here, the Supreme Court said these powerful words. They said, if the right of privacy means anything, it is a right of the individual to be free, to be free, to decide whether to bear or beget a child. That not only legalized birth control for unmarried people, first time in history, it was also the foundation for Roe v. Wade, 
quoted five separate times. It also, when uh, gay people had the right to get married several years ago, uh, I don't know if you know this, that Baird v. Eisenstadt, my case, was the foundation for legalizing marriage among gay people. So not only was that fundamental, but then came teenagers. I'm glad you got teenagers in that room because teenagers were the most discriminated group of people. Teenagers were told, if you want an abortion, you need the written permission of your parents or a judge. Now, if you could prove you're a mature minor, by the way, how many of you know what a mature adult is? I sure as hell don't. We got some guy running for, who's now president of the United States, not running, uh, Trump, who's about the most immature human, vicious, evil human being I've ever known in my life. Let's not get political. Okay, I won't get political. The league right. isn't political. Okay, well, this isn't political. It's a statement of reality. Uh, the guy is nuts. But uh, nevertheless, I, I think when you say to somebody, put your hand on your wife's private parts, I break his arm. Nobody, that's not political, that's reality. Anybody went up to my wife or my daughter or anybody who I cared about while I was near, I wouldn't let you get away with it. So at any rate- to Can I just interrupt? I'm sorry, right here. Um, I just have to let people know if they have questions, they have to direct the question to the question monitor, um, oh. not to me or anyone else because she is the one that will be able to ask the questions. Oh. Bill, the, um, what was the result of that? What was the case called, the Supreme Baird Court? Baird versus Bilotti. And Baird the case, versus Bilotti. So okay. Bilotti was the attorney general or something yeah, at the time? Let me tell you how life is. The case is called Baird versus Bilotti. That's the name of the case. Right. It was filed in 1974, the last day of the month of October, just before uh, the next month. And I did that purposely because the new law was supposed to go into effect. Who do you think calls me the next day? Planned Parenthood. How dare you steal our case was the first remark. I said, who is this? Planned Parenthood, we were going to take that case. Well, I said, I think your strategy is stupid. Why would you let a law take effect to fight it? The smarter thing to do, in my judgment, and I was right, was to challenge the law before it goes into effect. That made a lot, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a guy who thinks on his feet and is a street fighter. So uh, they were very angry. So we had the two cases. One was called Baird versus Bilotti, 1976, then 1979. Lo and behold- They were both named the same thing? Yeah. The cases? They both as wanted, soon as you finish this sentence, someone has a question. Okay, but do you, you, I gotta just give you the concept. Of okay. It's important that you understand this because this is history that none of you know because you're not told. You know, I've always said history belongs to those with money. And this whole document has been so, whole history has been so rewritten that it's so outrageous. I mean, as far I consider it a privilege to be for your group because I've always respected your group. It's the 100th anniversary, which is a great right. in itself. Uh, for me to be before you. But I am a fighter, as you can well tell. And so all of a sudden I'm at the clinic and I hear a scream. It's my head nurse. And I hear footsteps running down the hallway. By the way, I'm getting death threats all the time, okay? So door kicks open and there's a guy coming in about six foot one, about 25 years old. I'm in 50 something then, I'm now 88. He's got his hand raised high in the air. Was, I thought it was a knife or some kind of weapon. And so since I have a right of self-defense, I'm a former undefeated boxer. So when I blocked his hand, and I love this word, I gave him a right cross, right on the tip of the button, out like a light, grabbed him by the back of the neck, dragged him along the floor as he's coming to, we're on the second floor of my clinic, gently but firmly, push him down a flight of stairs, watch him bouncing. And as he goes out, I said, go back to your right, right to life buddies, don't you ever come in here again. Bounce right back up the steps, and my nurse is sagging in a chair, white as a ghost. I said, what happened? Did he hit you? Don't you know what you did? Yeah, I knocked out a right to life, and he'll never come back. That's a United States federal marshal serving you with papers. You're being sued by Planned Parenthood to argue half of your case, Baird v. Bilotti, before the U.S. Supreme Court. So are you kidding me? So I did the most normal thing anyone do. I panicked. <laughs> so I raced into Rhode Island, which was the closest state, 45 minutes away. Called up Joe Valero, my, at that time my friend, and I said, Joe, what do I do? He says, get your butt here. The guy's in my office with the police. They're waiting to arrest you. If they catch you alone, you, they're going to beat the crap out of you. So I wow. said, 
I said, well, I'm coming right over. I came over, the guy was there. The guy says, got you now, Baird. I said, wait a minute. Did you tell anybody that you showed any identification? You were a police officer or a U.S. federal market? He says, no, I didn't. So said, how the hell would I know who you are? So Joe goes in, he says, look what he did to my shirt. He ripped my shirt, $20 shirt in those days. Nero <laughs> reaches into his pocket, takes out a wallet with more money than I've seen in years, and takes out several hundred dollar bills. Here he says, it shows 20 bucks. Gives him several hundred dollars. Says, here, would you take this for a new shirt? And the guy who must have been as hard up for money as I was, he grabbed it. He says, okay, he says, case settled. In effect, call it a bribe, call it what you will, but I did not have to face a possible 20 year jail term. Right, right. The reason why I'm telling you that story. I, was, I won that case. I'm telling you it was with incredible pain and rage. I Absolutely. got a headline on his desk, Boston Globe, Baird angry. When I won that case, I won that case. What year was this again? 1979. Won 1979. That case. Planned Parenthood for their brief in, encounter with my case was awarded according to the documents on my desk, $150,000 my case, which cost me 200,000, that was my life savings. My life savings. Um, let me interrupt. I know that that must have been very painful for but you. But they wouldn't give a dollar. Wait, you got to understand this. Yeah. They wouldn't give me one dollar. I know. I just worry that people are asking questions and we're not being able to get to them. Okay. Well, I wanted them to know that there's something dreadfully wrong about a state. This is in your state, your people. But it's old news, right? Well, why is it old news? I'm starving. Well, it was I don't know why yeah, it was terrible. But this is how many years later we have opportunities. So much you did made make so much difference now. Yeah. You know, what you did and what you fought for has made so much difference. Well, but I want to show just one last thing. I lost my first wife and children. This you, you have to see. Can you see that headline? Right. It said abortion advocate jailed. A baby was in the audience. The five policemen arrested the mother for bringing her baby to my speech in Huntington, New York, which is where I live, Long Island. They jailed us both overnight. We faced three years in prison. I won the case, of course, but my children were told they would be executed. To punish me, they would be four kids, little kids, would be put to death at school somewhere. And of course, my first wife said, I'm out of here. Fled to New England where they've been in hiding all these years. Have nothing to do with me. They think that I put their life in danger. They didn't understand I was fighting for the three girls and one boy. I was fighting for their life, as well as the lives of those teenagers who are listening to this right now. And I believe that people have a right of privacy, but you can't do that without fighting for that right. I agree, and you really fought hard. Lynn, um, a question monitor? Um, we had someone who was wondering what the vote was by the Supreme Court. Very powerful vote, six to one. The only one against me was Chief Justice Berger, who again was about as brilliant as a pet rock. He was a guy <laughs> who said, well, let me tell you what he said in his private paper in my possession, uh, written in the, uh, well, what is the name of that paper, honey, from Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Law Review. It said by Roy Lucas, it said, this is what they said about uh, Roger Williams Law Review, basically saying that I was a street peddler hawking my wares, trying to make money uh, by giving away free MCO. They had fired me, by the way, because they knew I was going to be arrested. Right, to, right. It was going to uh, be in the news all the time. Yeah. They didn't want an executive in jail. So I sat back and said, man, what a price I've paid. You lose your family, go to jail, and then have now say you're a CIA agent, have planned parents to say there's nothing to be gained. Uh, the ACLU say there's nothing. And I sit back and I say, what planet do I live in? But to back up, I did it because I honestly believe that we are part of the human family. I would do this all over again, as wow. it may sound, because I love each and every one of you there, even though I don't even know you, but there's no way you would get somebody like me to risk 10 years of my life unless right. you believe we are all part of the human family. We owe it to each other to help Thank each you. other and care for each Thank other. Um, do you have other questions? Um, just a reminder, people can send me their questions if they have any, but I've got a couple. Um, so has, have you, are there particular parts of the country that you are most concerned about right now? I'm concerned right now where you are. Massachusetts is still a very strongly Catholic state, and this is offensive to some of you, but so be it. We all need a dose of, of reality. 
where do you think the greatest force is coming from? It's made, besides Trump. Greatest force is because of people's belief, religious belief, that fertilized eggs are people. Uh, as you may know, that uh, the doctrine of the Catholic Church, for instance, and this is not being really uh, political, but just a fact. If a fertilized egg is a person from the moment of conception, because the soul enters a conception, what do you do with the word called twinning, where the egg divides in half 10 days later? Does each twin get half a soul? Or each twin gets a whole soul, and the other gets none? Mm. You have to understand that if you're a Jew, Reformed Jews accept the right to an abortion. I'm a Unitarian. Unitarians accept the right to an abortion. The Methodist Church accepts the right to an abortion. And there are other Orthodox Jews don't. I have no fight with their religion, but don't you dare come into my household and tell me I've got to believe what you believe because mm -hmm. that violates separation of church and state, which is something I believe very powerfully in. Right. This might be a good time to talk about where you think we should be going from here given the current Supreme Court. The current Supreme Court is hell bent to destroy everything that people like me have fought for. You are witnessing or will witness the death of the abortion law as we know it, the birth control, and let me document it for you. The new woman, Barrett, who was just appointed? Uh, Amy Coney Bryant. Barrett? Barrett, sorry. Barrett. Now, yeah. Barrett is a person who heard my case two years ago in her home state of Indiana. The How case, did that happen? I uh, have you, you know, Baird v. Bellotti is heard all over the United States. I see. Most of the okay. time, it's disregarded because the court already ruled. They right. ruled that the law was constitutional for teenagers that, that they said the Bill of Rights is not for adults only. Uh, so you mean someone brought the case to Wisconsin again? Not to Wisconsin, to Indiana. And Indiana. they passed it. She, she went against it. She said, that's unconstitutional. Now that should have been on, well, every time you see Planned Parenthood on the news, that should have been up on the news. And it wasn't. Because right, they didn't question her on that. No, but you bring it up. I, I'll right. bring it up. That so what, what do you think people should be doing um, organizations like the League that have a, a, a stand on in favor of reproductive rights? Well, I think one of the first things you've got to do is recognize that we're at war. See, most of us don't see that. Most of us want to be goody two shoes and say, we can't be rude. We can't be, I don't think ever to be rude. I don't think I've ever been rude, but I've been strong and I've been very factual. Anything I, Steve will tell you this, when he had me lecture at different places through his lecture agency, we had two eight foot tables. Why do I have two eight foot tables? Because I, not only for defensive reasons, but I would lay out over a hundred documents. So if you challenge me, when I say abortions are nine times safer than childbirth, here's the AMA that says that. Or if I said fertilized egg is a person from conception, I would show the Catholic catalog that said that. So you document what you say. So the first thing I would do is recognize you're at war. Second, who's your enemy? Look at what you're fighting now. You've got these people who say that some pro-choice people eat babies and drink their blood. Are you freaking nuts? <laughs> so, I mean, there's no other word. Right. I think you're mentally mm -hmm. ill. If, so, I put, yes. if I put That's a good. pencil dot on this screen, the human egg is about a quarter of the size of a pencil dot. If I said that quarter size egg is equal to you, I think you're nuts. But if you want to be nuts, I have no problem with that. But don't yeah. have other people believe it by law okay. and put them in jail if they disagree. We have a couple more questions. Yeah, I think this one ties in pretty well. Um, given the current climate where there are all these really emotional arguments around abortion, um, what can people do who are feeling concerned besides donate to advocacy groups? Well, the first thing you can do, honestly, get somebody like me to come out and speak at your school through this, this gadget, whatever it's called. Uh, I, I, I cannot at the age of 88 travel around because of the risk of this freaking virus. Uh, I've got a wife who I love and treasure, but she guards me like a book. And uh, so I don't go out much, but I, I love this gadget, even though I can't even begin to understand how it works. It's just beyond my scope of understanding. But <laughs> I would love to be able to get out and speak to pe people candidates oh, okay. uh, and the, you know pick help pick good promoting rational yeah humans yeah get yeah first. like my wife is brilliantly saying uh, so often to me that get good candidates like biden is a good one we're not supposed to be political okay but uh get candidates out there who would look and say i recognize reality women are people what see i have a belief 
who in the world can get pregnant? You've never heard of men, although there's some research done in China, China years ago of transplanting embryos into men. That didn't go very far. Uh, but if men had one menstrual cramp, they become instant converts. I've said that over and over again. <laughs> men are incredibly brave with your body. No man has ever died in a waiting room in my clinic. And I right. ran three right. largest clinics. So women can die of childbirth. Uh, you can hemorrhage to death. There's lots of things that can go wrong from childbirth or from an abortion. So the one who has the absolute and only right to make that decision is that woman alone, alone regardless of age. I don't care if you're 12 year old or if you're, uh, my oldest patient was uh, 54 from University of Massachusetts, uh, that people must have that basic human right to make that decision. And for men to be so callous to say, well, we can pick it outside your clinic, call you murderer because that's free speech. And some of my side agree with that. I say, really? I tell you what, uh, I, we did abortions at our clinic for years, three, one in Boston, two in New York. What we would do is this, we make an incision in the scrotum, lift up the vent. Eh, don't go into great detail. Okay, <laughs> all right, T tie off the vest after. Okay, that's done. But here's the thing though, tell you what there, Mr. Right to Life group, here's what you do. Have your buddies outside scream murder and killer or whatever you want to call us while we're making that incision into the scrotum and we slip or you jump. And all of a sudden, you don't have your equipment there. Right. Holy smokes. Would you say that free speech? No. In New York yeah. City, you cannot honk a car horn within 100 feet of a hospital. Yeah. If you can respect the hospital not to honk your car horn, how dare you stand in front of my clinic or any other clinic and say, I can call you murderer or kill, copy down your license plate. And in New York at that time, when they're outside my clinic, they would find out where you live. And by finding out where you live, they can call you at home at three o'clock in the morning and play this record. Mommy, mommy, why did you murder me? Why did you murder me? And then hang up. Oh, horrible. Lindsay, did you have another question? Yeah, we got two more that are kind of related. So I'm going to ask them together. Um, okay. One is, do you think that we need a constitutional amendment to protect the right to an abortion? And another is, do you believe that the ERA would protect women's rights to choose and control their bodies? Judging the basic intelligence and lack of that I've seen so much in this country, I think you got to spell it out word for word. A constitutional amendment that says the right of privacy exists and it exists for abortion, for birth control, and a lot of other rights, by the way. Uh, I think it's outrageous that in this year that we're still, still worried about can women be forced, even if they're raped? Think of the child that I had, 12-year-old child, who, by the way, called me. Uh, only this year, uh, 40 years later, uh, wow. to tell me that she still goes through psychological turmoil because after she had the abortion, her mother kicked her out of the house because she didn't believe she would rape. The husband said, oh, I didn't really rape her. We both were fooling around. Uh, I mean, it's just it's sickening. Certainly there are huge, you know, strong, strong feelings on this issue from the very beginning to now, Joyce, um, if you want to ask a question, can you do it through the question monitor? Do you know how to do that? Because we're not unmuting. You just hit up above the three dots and it says chat and you can ask the question. Can I ask the question? I've raised my hand. Uh, yes, but not anybody else because this isn't <laughs> the way we want to do it. No, I, I don't know about other states, but we in Massachusetts have a law now before the state house called the Roe Act which would protect at least what limited way a row, which is not comprehensive enough, but row protects at least in the state of Massachusetts. Does the league take a role? And someone asked, what can the league do? What can we do short of giving money? I think that was the question monitor asked. Um, and one of the things to do is to support every single state house representative uh, in our case, we're lucky we have Joe Comerford and Mindy Dome who are wonderful and who are very much advocates of reproductive rights, but to put, uh, get the league in those particular districts in the state of Massachusetts to well, work with their state representative on this particular act. Well, actually, I think the league is doing, I think the league is doing quite a bit of work on the Roe Act. We, our league is having at the end of January, Tracy Brown, who is um, from the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts and on the legislative side of things to tell us about the Roe Act, what they've been doing, you know, what they think the future will be and how to get it through. Right now, what I understand, and if anybody knows I'm wrong, you know, let me know, um, 
it has gone through the House and the Senate and is on Governor Baker's desk. That's what I heard last. And we've been but, asked, people yeah. have been asked to call Governor okay, Baker. So let me follow but the wing up. is lobbying, I'm sure. Let me just follow that up with one thing, Sharon. We have an abortion rights action league here in a, a funding agency here in Western Massachusetts in our Amherst area where we have been donating money so that someone from another state, well, let's say Indiana, uh, cannot get an abortion there to provide the transportation to get to Massachusetts and get the medical services that they need here in our state, assuming Baker signs it. Is there any a relationship that you would have, or is that too political an act for the league? To I don't know the answer that? to that. I mean, it's definitely a question if you're willing to, to you know, go onto the League of Women Voters of Mass website and ask, but also when Tracy Brown comes to speak, which yeah. you know, maybe after the fact, um, they'll know a lot more and she'll be able to help you. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions? Can I just uh, reply to that for a brief second? All right. The, At uh, the, the end, you mean, or now? No, right now. It's, well, okay. I do remember the question. The question oh, right. dealing with uh, finances. Uh, University of Maine was the first university in the United States in 1968, and then followed a few years later by, believe it or not, University of Massachusetts and uh, Amherst. But what they set up by me was called an abortion slush fund. That's what I called it. And we set them up all across the United States where students would borrow money, like $100 for an abortion. And then they would add, when they paid it back from that fund, they would add $25 to it to increase it. And that would help this fund grow to help more and more students. And that got a great deal of press when I established that in the early uh, or the late 60s, before it was even legal. By the way, one last thing, this is crucial to show you. Uh, there's a magazine which uh, called Sepia. I don't know if you can see it, but on the top of the magazine- I see it. It says, can you see the date, 1967, and it says for an abortion. That's the clinic number, my clinic number. And it's a big article about my clinic. But what am I showing you? 1967, that was a 10 year jail term. I was risking 10 years in jail for every woman I helped from all across the country to get, help them get an abortion. And not only at my clinic, but other clinics that I knew were underground. And I did, and I never got arrested for that. I always got arrested for teaching birth control. And Dr. Rappaport. Dr. Rappaport, my close friend, for well, 10 years, yeah. friend of mine, who we worked um, with. Joyce, there's somebody in the audience that um, has more info from the league. So who is that person that would like to perhaps say something about what Joyce brought up? Um, Judy. Would you? May? There you are. Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm co-president of the State League, and the bill um, is now on to Governor Baker's um, desk, and that's where we're focusing our lobbying efforts uh, in terms of we're encouraging. Um, I think there was an action alert that went out um, last week to uh, encourage Governor Baker to sign, um, and it's part of the budget. Um, plan. Um, and uh, if you go to our state league website, you can catch up on our action alerts and the letters that we send. We also are part of a number of coalitions, the, the Vote Coalition. Mm -hmm. So we're, um, you know, that helps magnify our voice when we, uh, mm -hmm. with our lobbying work. But the one thing I did put in the chat to the question monitor is that the, the people in the, in the state house know the league uh, has, we have feet on the ground. We're not just an organization where people send money in and uh, and you know the staff people write the the lobbying. They know that we have actual people in our towns who go to the local legislature uh, right. and and either say thank you for supporting the bill and you're absolutely right on this Roe Act. We need to give those people support because there are some very poor, there are a lot of powerful voices in our state who go after directly after those legislators. So our support for them is really important for them to continue to support abortion rights uh, or get Thank to protect you. abortion rights. Uh, but they, so anything you can do at your local level, contacting your state senator, your state legislator, writing a note to Governor Baker is really helpful because if we can get all 3,000 people who are members of the league in our state to write those letters, that's, that's powerful. It's very helpful. Thank you, Judy. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, any more questions that Bill needs to answer? I think we have one last one, um, which is in two parts. 
So what would happen if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe v. Wade and then specific to Massachusetts, would the Roe Act in Massachusetts protect abortion rights here if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe v. Wade? I, uh, you're asking me what I, I don't know how gutsy your legislative body is. I know when I was there that I'm most timid group because <laughs> when, when I was there, listen to this. Now, there was an editorial in my possession here in the Boston uh, University of, uh, uh, newspaper, and they clearly said, betrayal of Baird. And what it was, not one single legislator, not one, came to my defense. No one from now came to my defense. No one from the ACLU, after they dropped my case, came to my defense. And of course, at that stage, the early stages, Planned Parenthood did everything they could to sabotage my case by saying there was nothing to be gained by it. And I still am very frustrated by it because I do think that if I can fight for you, and I have, I don't think it's wrong for you to fight for me and call a legislator and say, you know what? You ripped this guy off of his life savings, 200 grand for Baird versus Bilotti. Planned Parenthood, who really has a multi-million dollar corporation, got a lot of money from his case, working on his case. Does that sound right to you? That a guy 88 years of age can is having a very tough time just surviving? And then everyone says, well, that was then. So I got news for you. I'm still eating today. Just frustrates me. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just had to step away a second. Um, Steve is coming back on. He wanted to mention something about volunteering. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, he's got to unmute. Unmute. I am now unmuted. Okay. We have no, thank you very room. much for uh, for coming out and, and hello. Can you hear me? We, yeah, we hear you. We okay, hear good. You. Yeah, I just want to make sure you can. Okay, Bill, I want to thank you for coming out uh, and, and making this presentation. Every time I hear you speak, uh, it, 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 it starts my guts boiling again uh, and, and, and gets me Might wanting to do stopped. something. <laughs> Yeah, and what but I want to say to everybody else who is listening, if you want to know what you can do, you can be like Bill. And, and that's what I try to do. I try to be like Bill. If there's somebody you can talk to, talk to them. If there's, if there's something you can, you can say about protecting the rights of women for reproductive rights, say it. Write a letter to the editor. Write a, a, a note on, on, on FaceTime, uh, or Facebook rather. Um, or, or on, on Twitter. Do something. Don't just sit here and say, my God, it's good that somebody else is doing it. Do something. If there's a wrong, try to fix it. If there's, if it's, if there's about to be a wrong, try to prevent it. Uh, and I will be happy to work with any organization uh, pro, uh, pro bono uh, on, on communications on this issue. Steve, I, I, let me add Thank one you. thing. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, folks, you well, know, why don't you guys take this offline? You two. No, no, I'm, <laughs> oh, I don't want it offline because as I'm talking to the people who are listening, particularly the 10 uh, high school youngsters, to be able to say, hey, look, we're all people. I, I get my mail all the time that says I should die. They're praying for my death. How nice it would be to hear, gee, Bill Baird, uh, thank you for being here. or Thank you for trying to help us. Uh, you don't hear that. But we hear, well, that was in the past. Why is it so wrong to say to somebody who's been wounded by this very society to say, look, I will help you. Okay, there's nothing wrong with saying we helped other social reformers, but this topic, the women's group says, we don't want to know you. Right. We don't want to know you. Well, you've got a volunteer right there. Okay. Um, we, we are after the hour. So unless there's something urgent, I need to wind this up. But Bill, you had told me you had a personal message that you wanted to share with people before I close the meeting. Well, the personal message is basically that we all are part of the human family, that we need to work together, men and women, black and white, gay and straight. We can't have to stop this concept of separating each other into groups. And we are one family and to reach out to each other. If I hurt, hopefully you will hurt. And if you hurt, hopefully I'll come and help you when you hurt. And that's what we've got to do when we're part of a family. But don't do as we're currently doing and say, well, Bill Baird, you've had five Supreme Court cases, three that bear your name. Uh, you know, we don't want to know you anymore. So. Right. I mean, I have to say, you know, to all of you, you know, the reason we wanted you to hear Bill was because people have no idea 
of what people, what he went through specifically, but what had to happen to get to the place we got to. And um, it's easily forgotten. And I think it's important for people to remember. Um, Bill, I wanna thank you so much for spending your time with us and for telling us your history. We Great. so, so appreciate it. And we appreciate uh, that you went to jail for us. Um, so thank you so much for that. I wanna thank Robin for organizing the Zoom and Lindsay, our question monitor, and the people that um, asked questions and also my husband for his wonderful offer at the end and for his intro at the beginning. I just wanna remind everybody that on January 28th at 7 p.m., we will be hosting another Zoom meeting with Tracy Brown from the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts. And she will have more information on the Roe Act and where we're at and what the league can do and what other people can do that are interested in working hard for this subject. Um, we'll post that information as soon as we put it all together on our website, which is lwbss.org and on our Facebook and Instagram pages and obviously in local media as well. So feel free to check out our Facebook and Instagram pages and our website at any time um, and let folks know um, that we're gonna be posting this particular meeting on cable, um, Stoughton Media Access and on Sharon Cable and other towns if they should want it so that everybody can learn how it all started and who really started it all. Otherwise, who knows where we would be. I wanna thank everybody so much uh, for coming and thank all of you. And I hope that you've gained a lot. And Bill, thank you so much. Great to see you all. Good night. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Oh, you have a question, Lindsay? Johnny. I just wanna thank Johnny too.